Good morning, Instant Impact 2018. This is going to be a fantastic day for us. Have you guys checked out that schedule? There are so many cool, really productive kinds of presentations on there. There are, are presentations about problem solving, uh, about strategy, about agile. We have a lunchtime leadership uh, presentation, a keynote that looks fantastic. And um, who's looking forward to happy hour? Right, reception, it's, uh, you know, we got a little late start, it's, it's after 8.30 now, so I think reception time is, is on our brain, right? It's a, good, it's a good idea for us. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, uh, this is, is a second year that I've had the opportunity to be here with you all, and before I get started, I do have to say thanks to Tracy. Where are you, Tracy? Are you still in here? Uh, Tracy and Julie, who's not here this morning, they did such a fantastic job of putting this together, made it really easy for me to come from out of town to be here for this event. So Tracy, wherever you are, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. So the theme for Instant Impact 2018, of course, is innovate, integrate, and motivate. And my whole goal up here for this morning is to share some innovative ideas with you that hopefully you'll be able to integrate into your daily practices and hopefully I can create a little bit of an atmosphere that will motivate you to take advantage and put the ideas that you pick up today to work. Okay, so that's what my goal is today. You'll see from the title of the program that I'm going to be talking about conflict and the whole idea around how do we get from destructive conflict to more productive conflict. Now there's an absolute prerequisite for productive conflict in an organization. Anybody have an idea what that prerequisite might be? Trust. trust, exactly, it's trust. We cannot get to productive conflict unless we have trust in our organizations. Now, very frequently, what I'll do, especially in these morning kind of uh, situations is get everybody up, get the blood pumping a little bit, and do some trust falls. So I get a combination of groans and laughter there. Well, don't worry, uh, because I've, I've, I've recently changed my perspective on trust falls. I've gotten some new information that makes me kind of rethink uh, doing this first thing in the morning. And how do I explain it? Well, best thing for me to do is actually share with you a video that highlights what I mean. Okay, the morning's gonna catch you. Okay, it's called the trust fall. Okay, trust fall. Ready, set, go. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is hor terrible, right? Terrible idea. We did that, someone could get hurt, PMI gets sued, Tracy and Julie don't invite me back. So, so we're not gonna do the trust falls, you're off the hook with that there. Um, but what I do wanna do is, uh, like I said, share some of those innovative ideas that are really around what can we do as project managers and as team members to drive to better, more productive conflict. Because what I've seen with the ideas and the topics that I'm gonna be talking about, we've seen people and organizations get better project results, faster project results, and quite honestly, have more fun on the team. Because, I mean, the projects that we work on and the, and the jobs that we do should be fun, right? It's, it's important work. So if we can have some more fun while we're being more productive, that's a win in my book. Using the video here, I kind of want to highlight, this is the, the, the current state for a lot of teams where you have this mistrust and frustration with teammates. The goal of all of this talk is really to move from that kind of situation to something more like this, where you're an aligned team working together to solve a problem and effectively achieving your goal. Boom, right? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great if all of our teams worked that effectively together? So that's what, what we're gonna be talking about here. So I think it might be helpful to give you a little bit of my background about my journey. So in 2011, I co-founded this company called Integris Performance Advisors. <clears throat> Prior to that, I was uh, running engagements for a consulting company that focused on Lean Six Sigma and project management. It's kind of, kind of more of the, the technical side 
of those topics. And we did some fantastic projects, delivered millions of dollars of return. We're working with big organizations like GE and Starwood and Cisco, as well as uh, some of the government uh, agencies up here in Washington, and really delivered a whole lot of really strong project results. The thing that kept me up, though, was the fact I was getting executives asking me questions like, how do we get this lean thinking to be part of the DNA of our organization? Well, this is back in the early 2000s, and, and what were we doing in the Lean Six Sigma world back then? Well, we were training green belts, we were training black belts, right? We are using the, the GE model from Jack Welsh that said, hey, 10% of your, your, your workforce should be green belts, and 3% should be black belts, and that's going to change your culture into this problem-solving culture. Well, you know, it wasn't really working. Again, like I said, we were doing great projects, but we weren't having that impact on, uh, on the culture the way that the executives wanted and what we really wanted to achieve. So we started looking at that. Uh, some of my consultant colleagues and I started talking with clients, started doing some research, and we really came to the conclusion, the thing we're missing is this issue all around teamwork and leadership and team dynamics. And I'll tell you, once we, we made that decision to start this new company that focused both on operational excellence kind of techniques and project management techniques, the techno side, as well as working on the software, the, 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 the people side of things, man, the stories I started to hear around the number of organizations that were struggling with things like trust, uh, lack of respect in the workforce. Right? These are, are issues that were really coming to the fore. So I knew when we started this company that we had a really good market opportunity. Quite honestly, I didn't know it was that good until we really started getting into it. So that's where we are today with this. As we, as we look at what happens with teamwork and what happens specifically with this idea of conflict, We've done a lot of research, both our own and uh, drawing from other studies out there. And one of the things that we've seen is that there are a percentage of people that have reported, we have complete project failure because of destructive conflict on our team. Any of you ever had project failure on your teams because of, of destructive conflict? We have about 10% of employees are reporting that projects fail because of the conflict that happens. Personal attacks and insults. This is something that a lot of employees talk about, right? They get into conflict and they say, you know what, it turns negative. I'm feeling attacked. In fact, we had over 25% report that they're experiencing or witnessing these personal attacks and these assaults, insults. If we take it further, how about anger and frustration? Anybody had anger and frustration coming out of a, uh, of a conflict situation on a team or with a coworker, right? We're getting more than 55% of people are reporting coming out of anger or coming out of, of conflict that they're having frustration and they're having anger. And the last data point I'll share with you, anybody ever avoided a colleague because you were upset with them or because there was something that was going on disagreement wise? Anybody? Huh? All right, well you're not alone. Over 75% in the data that we've seen report that at one point or another, they have gone through the process of avoiding a colleague because of this destructive kind of conflict. So the idea here is that this destructive conflict is really damaging to what we're trying to achieve on our teams, right? So if we can get a handle on what the driver is of this destructive conflict and move more to productive conflict, aren't we gonna eliminate a lot of those issues, right? So there's one uh, uh, story that I wanted to share with you that, that made me start thinking about teams in a little bit different way. So last year, I gained an uncle. Now, it's kind of a funny way to say I got married, but since my wife isn't actually germane to this story that I'm going to tell you, I'm going ahead and going with the uncle story. So the first time that I met Uncle Bob was Thanksgiving a couple of years ago. And when I walked into his house, he had all of these polished stones, like what you see on the screen there, had all these stones up on his mantle and on the shelves. And so, I, of course, I, I asked him a little bit about those. You know, hey, what's up with these things? He tells me he has been collecting river stones since he was a little boy. Now, Uncle Bob's probably about 65, 70 years old. So some of these stones that he had are somewhere in that order of 50, 60 years old. So he says to me, you know how these get made? Does anybody, anybody a rock polisher in here? Show of hands, no one? Okay, I'm certainly not. So I was like, no, I, you know, tell me, how's it go? So he says, come on, 
I look over at his wife Sharon and she rolls her eyes like she knows what's coming. I have no clue. So we go into the, into the garage and he says, take a look at this. And he flicks this switch and all of a sudden this drum that he has starts tumbling. And my gosh, now I know why Sharon was rolling her eyes. I hear this, ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. So he turns it off, reaches in, pulls out a, a, one of the stones, and it's, it's getting to look like this, this kind of polished stone. And uh, it was a couple of weeks later, I was thinking about this issue of teamwork. We were doing a, another presentation, working on our project. And I started thinking, you know this whole idea of polishing stones? There's an analogy for teamwork in there, right? Because what happens in that, in that drum? That drum gets going, and if you put it in there for the right amount of time, those stones will conflict, conflict with each other, right? They'll, they'll agitate each other, but they'll get to this point where they have this perfect outcome, right? They look beautiful, right? What happens, or what would happen, if Uncle Bob turned that thing on and left it for a month? Sand, Sand right? They, they, they'd get destroyed. It would, it would just... It, it would destroy these rocks and wouldn't achieve anything. And quite honestly, that's like teams, right? If we engage in this destructive conflict, if we uh, have these situations where we're having attacks and insults and we're avoiding each other, that's that destructive conflict on that far end that's going to destroy that team. But there's another side of destructive teamwork. What happens if Bob goes out there, puts his new rocks in there, flicks the switch, lets it turn twice, and turns it off? Nothing, right? Nothing's going to happen at all. That's that artificial harmony that, that exists on so many teams. Makes me think of, you guys remember the movie scene? Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? Anyone? Right? No one's talking. No, no one's adding their ideas. So when I think about this whole story with the rocks and the tumbler and connecting that with teamwork, it seems to me that the idea isn't for us to eliminate conflict from teams. Because after all, conflict is where we get those ideas out on the table, right? That's, that's where we start talking about the different, um, different ideas, the different solutions. But if we take it too far to that, that mean-spirited attack, we're destroying the team. And if we don't go far enough, we still are not getting to where we want to go with that. So I like to talk about conflict and productive conflict as this, the unfiltered constructive debate of ideas. Now, if we don't have conflict on our teams, if we don't have this debate, what else is going to happen besides those outcomes that I talked about? Well, first of all, many times the dumb answer is going to win, right? How many times is the very first answer the best answer for the team or for the solution, right? We need to be talking about those things. The other thing is that if people don't weigh in, they're not likely to buy in to our decision as a team. So let me say that again. If people don't weigh in, they're not going to buy in. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that we all want to be heard, right? We all have our ideas and we all want to have our emotional layer. So what we've seen on most of the teams we work with, if people have the opportunity to respectfully weigh in with their ideas, share what they're thinking, have an honest, open debate about things, even if their idea doesn't win, they're still bought into the solution because they feel heard. So that's why I say people need to weigh in for them to buy in. If we get people weighing in to buy in, if we get to more of this productive conflict, do you think we can put a dent in this kind of a number here? The 62%, right? I mean, this is, this is why I like talking about this kind of a topic, because the opportunity is right there for us. Take a look at this. Tell me what you see. This is the audience participation part of the event. How many people see a vase? Okay. How many people see two faces? Okay. We got about 70, 30 see the faces. Okay. That's good. How about this one? You guys remember this one? Let's see if our sound is turned on here. Do we have sound? We'll come back to it. You guys, you guys know what's coming here? You guys have all, all done this one? We good? Yeah. 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 Okay, how many people here Laurel? 
What's wrong with the rest of you? That's clearly Laurel. Does anybody hear Yanni? I, it's, it's incredible. I have listened to this a whole bunch of times, probably too many times. Uh, and I still cannot hear the Yanni. Um, although I did hear one time where they slowed it down and you could hear it. But anyway, I digress. So what's going on here, right? The faces or the vase, the Yanni or the Laurel. What's really going on with this, right? Our brains are getting the same stimuli, yet we're doing something different with it, right? Our brains are processing things in a different way. Now, there is neuroscience that has helped us to start to, to really understand some of this of what's going on. So let's take, for example, the spectrum of extroversion and introversion, okay? So extroversion and introversion has, the, the research on that goes back to the 1920s, Carl Jung, William Marston, and there was a lot of, of psychologists looking at that. And one of the theories was pretty simply that, you know, extroverts, they just need a whole lot more stimulation to get to that level of satisfaction, right? That was kind of the basic theory. And, and that kind of bears out. I mean, if you think about a rock concert, who are the folks that are up in the front, right? Standing against the, the stage, getting the, you know, kind of smashed around a little bit. Those are probably your extroverts, right? The introverts are really more a little farther back away from the stage, probably at home reading a book, right? So this idea of extroversion and introversion, it turns out, is really wired in our brains. There is neuroscience that now tells us this. So there is a, uh, an organ at the base of our brainstem called the ascending reticular, um, ah, it's ERIS for short, the, the ascending reticular activating system. ERIS for short, and I'm going to stick for ERIS for obvious reasons. So what the ERIS does is it, it limits or lets in internal stimulation. So if everybody's brain is wanting one level of kind of stimulation, there's an ideal and optimum point, there are some people that that ERIS opens up and lets in a whole bunch of stimulation, right? So you're, you're almost here. Here's the ironic thing. If your heiress lets in a whole lot of stimulation, what does that make you? It makes you an introvert, right? This seems kind of counterintuitive to me, right? So basically what we're saying is introverts, they're actually over aroused all the time, right? Because if, you're, if your ideal point is here and you're already here, you don't need much external uh, input or stimulation to get to that optimum point. And if you get too much, that's stressful, right? Or as, as my, uh, my very introverted colleague, Samantha, says, when you go over this, that's just really annoying. <laughs> so what about from the point of view of uh, extroverts then, right? So we still have that same level here, but if we're da way down here, we have all this room. We need all of this, this external stimulation to fill up, right? And so that's why we're probably more likely to go to the loud parties, go to the big gatherings, things like this. So it's about this time where I see a lot of smiles on people's faces, and it seems to come from the more introverted side of the group, because this is where the introverts in the room start to think, haha, uh -huh, I knew it. We're so much closer to balanced than you extroverts. <laughs> you extroverts are just these broken people that need all this external stuff. Right? We're, we're right here. We're good. So it turns out that this extroversion and introversion is actually a brain chemistry thing. So what I want to do is give you a quick little insight from, to, to bring this home, I'll give you a quick little story from my home. So I'm, as you might guess, the more extroverted one. Well, you don't know the rest of my, my family, but I'm, I'm on the high extroversion side. And so when it comes around to Friday, I'm the one in the family that's most likely to say, hey, it's Friday night. We're not doing anything. Let's go out. Let's make plans. Let's, let's figure something out. Well, my wife, Maxine, she's a little bit more on the introversion side, and she's a whole lot more likely to say, hey, it's Friday night. We're not doing anything. <laughs> she leaves it there. She leaves it there. So I want to get an idea of where you all are on the extroversion scale. So uh, what I want you to think about is, you know, where do you recharge? Where do you like to spend your time? Now, I am not going to ask everybody to raise your hand if you're an introvert, raise your hand if you're an extrovert. I know the extroverts would love that, but I think 
It's still a little early, so I'm not going to put you guys out there in front of 200 strangers or near strangers. I don't know if you guys, I don't think y'all know each other. But I do want to identify this. So we're going to do this in two steps. The first step is I want you to turn to somebody at your table and exchange that information, whether you're, you cl kind of uh, uh, classify yourself as more extroverted or more introverted. And hang on, extroverts, be so non-social for just a second. Let me explain what number two is. So number two is I will ask you to raise your hand, but what I'm going to ask you to do is raise your hand for the person who you just spoke to. So you're not identifying your own extroversion or introversion, you're actually identifying the extroversion or the introversion of the person next to you. Okay, make sense? Okay, go ahead and share. Okay, all right, everybody share? Okay, let's see what we have here. Raise your hand, raise your hand if the partner you just spoke to is an extrovert. Just a few of us. And how about if your partner is an, an introvert? Raise your hand. There we go, there we go. So it's a very introverted, dominant kind of a, of a group. Great, well we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, to uh, mention here, uh, this whole idea of extroversion and introversion. Has anybody ever been in a meeting where some new information gets thrown out on the table and suddenly somebody starts just, oh, this is what we need to do and this, this is what I think of that and somebody else kind of sits back and kind of, hmm, right? All right, that happens all the time, right? It, it comes down to this. The extroverts very much like to talk it through where introverts are more about thinking it through, right? So I have a story for you. So there was an organization I was working with a few months ago called FIRST. Has anybody ever heard of FIRST? It's a nonprofit that helps getting kids uh, involved with STEM programs, science, technology, engineering, and math programs. This was actually started by Dean Kamen, who, uh, among other things, he's the guy that uh, created the Segway. Um, anyway, this organization, uh, anybody ever seen Robot Wars? Yeah. Really, you know, kind of do that thing? So they do a big competition with Robot Wars. And by big, I mean pretty big. Their last annual event had 70,000 people in it. They bring five-year-old to 18-year-old kids together. So it's a fantastic organization. They're doing fantastic work. As an aside, if you happen to have any, any kids that are interested in STEM, look these guys up because the program is amazing. It's amazing. So I happened to be working with their marketing team. And we were uh, doing some teamwork, some team dynamics kinds of things. And this idea of extroversion and introversion came up. We had not much more of a conversation than what we just had here. And one of the women stands up and says, okay, we should have done this three years ago. I've been pulling my hair out for I can't tell you how long trying to get you people to speak up in meetings. But now I finally get it that you're actually wired differently, right? You're not just being obstinate. You're actually just wired differently. And for whatever, she had never really thought about it that way. And in that moment, with just that kind of conversation, that team was able to overcome so much of this issue, right? This woman just got a better understanding of how her pre-wiring did not align with the other folks and their pre-wiring and that was throwing her off. So do you think that with that kind of conversation you're able to put a dent in some of these, uh, these causes of, uh, of destructive conflict? Yeah, we see it all the time. It's fantastic to see. So there's one other spectrum that I want to talk, touch on here and that's the spectrum of being a little bit more skeptical versus being a little bit more accepting. So if you happen to be, and, and these really are spectrums, I'm, I'm asking you to go binary, kind of go one or the other, but we know, you know, we're, most of us are somewhere in the middle there. But if you're on the more skeptical side, you probably don't take things at face value, you probably challenge other people's thoughts a little bit, right? 
Whereas if you're more on that accepting side, you're, you know, you're, you're more focused on the relationship, you might uh, focus a little bit more on, on feelings and take that into consideration as, you, um, uh, as you're making decisions. So if you had to put yourself in one side or the other, go ahead and do that in your mind now and, and tell your partner who you told the extroversion and introversion, tell them whether you find yourself more on the uh, skeptical side or more on the accepting side. Go ahead. Okay. All right, great. Well, I'm not going to ask you to identify that because I actually just want to go ahead and move on. Because what we have here, if we put these two spectrums together, we get this grid. And there's a lot of information in this grid. It's really exciting and powerful stuff. So what I want you to do is think about, take your, where you put yourself on that extroversion introversion scale and where you put yourself on that skeptical versus accepting scale and think about which quadrant are you in. Are you in one? Are you in two? Are you in three? Or are you in four? Okay? And I'm going to first speak to group number two. So raise your hand if you are in that number two. I'm guessing we don't have a ton of us. Just a few of you. Okay. So, so I've been studying mind reading. And so since there's only a few of you here, I need you to think really hard. What I want you to do is think about a song that would kind of represent your personality style. All right, don't, don't sell, yell it out loud or don't talk about it. Just think, what's a, what's a good song? I'm, I'm going to try this new practice that I have of, of mind reading here. So let me focus on you here. Okay, I think I got it. I think I have that in the phone here. Is this it? Let's all celebrate and have a good time. Celebration. So did I get it? Is some of you, some of you guys singing that? Right? So the, the, the two, the, the second quadrant there, you, know, you are the folks that tend to be very enthusiastic about things, right? Driving towards uh, good action, want to get things done with, you know, let's get things moving. And you like to collaborate with people, right? As, as the song says, there's a party going on right here, right? That's that quadrant too. Some of the famous uh, kinds of personalities that share that style, we have here Will Smith, Oprah, Penny from Big Bang, and of course, uh, Dr. McCoy there. And I don't know if you like the old Star Trek or the new Star Trek, so I figured I'd cover my bases. We got them both here. <laughs> so let me move down here to quadrant number four. Let me see my quadrant number four people. Okay, there's a good amount of you. Okay, so same thing. We're going to do some mind reading here. Go ahead and start thinking about that theme song. Okay, I'm getting some of you saying or thinking, I can't think of a song because there's nothing perfect enough. <laughs> who's doing that? So who's, 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 who's that coming through? All right? Stop that. Say it. Say it. I want it that way. All right, all right. So you all, right, the, the priority around accuracy is, is probably pretty relevant to you. You likely uh, use your logic and challenge ideas. And my guess is that you like to get stability in your outcomes, right? That some of those explanations kind of hit the mark there. If we think about who are some of the famous personalities, you keep good company. Right? Einstein, Diane Sawyer, Sheldon Cooper, who happens to have a great name. I always wanted to have a son named Sheldon. Um, and Mr. Spock. Pick your, uh, your, your era of Mr. Spock there. Okay, let's move to your ones. Quadrant number one. Where are you? Raise some hands. Okay, a little bit smaller group. You guys give me a thought. Bam! Man, you guys, you guys think about this quick, don't you? And I would say that this is a pretty accurate one. Right? 
right? Not of PMI, but of the world, of the world. <laughs> well, you all in that quadrant number one, I bet really push towards results, right? You're taking action and you're likely challenging the status quo quite a bit. I'm guessing that's a little bit of what you all do. And if you think about the company you keep, the other personalities that are in this style, we have Madonna, Venus Williams, Bernadette from Big Bang, and of course, Captain Kirk from Star Trek. And finally, last but certainly not least, our threes, our quadrant number three. Raise your hand, threes. Where are you? Okay. Now I know you all have been thinking about this song since we did the four, right? You've been kind of going through it, going through it. Well, here's your chance. Go ahead and, and give me a song. Let me think about it here. Let me lock in. Okay, this takes me back to high school. Say it. All right, all right. Yeah, it's a little, little Bon Jovi uh, going on there. Well, good song, I would say apropos. So you, this, this quadrant here, support is a big priority, I'm guessing, for most of you, supporting others. You probably like to collaborate with others, and I'm guessing you guys like a stable environment, right? Some of the folks that, that you all share this personality type, we have Gandhi, Rajesh uh, from Big Bang, Mother Teresa, and of course, Mr. Zulu there. So, do we have some, is there, is there, I mean, the fact that I was able just by kind of getting a sense of, hey, how extroverted or introverted are you, and how accepting or skeptical are you, kind of identifying where some of these things are. Is there some good information in there? Right? I mean, this is, this is I was able to essentially identify some of your kind of core priorities or core characteristics. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these are spectrums. So, you know, we're not just these four types, but these are the four kind of big types. And I think that is so fascinating. I think the, the opportunity to use this kind of information to move from that destructive conflict and that, that personality clash, to move from that to how do we get more productive with each other? How do we communicate more effectively with each other? I think there's a whole lot of value in that. But there's, there's something missing here with this. If, if, uh, if we wanted to use something like that for uh, attacking the 62% of where the conflict comes from, if we're project managers and working on teams, what is missing from trying to use this? I'll give you a hint. I'll just tell you. It's a name, it's an acronym actually, right? Can we have a tool? Can we use a tool if it doesn't have an acronym? Right? My toolbox doesn't have any tools without any acronyms. It's kind of like if, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it make any noise? I would argue if a tool doesn't have an acronym, does it actually exist? You know, I don't know, but we do have an acronym for this. Who knows what that acronym might be? It's DISC. D stands for dominance, I stands for influence, S stands for steadiness, and C stands for conscientiousness. Now, this, this framework, this, this, uh, this acronym, allows us to talk then in generalities and when we get more into it, then a little more specifics around what are our personality characteristics, what are our tendencies, what are the, the, the things that we are likely to do during conflict that will both be productive and be unproductive. We normally show it in this kind of a circumplex, and again, you could be anywhere in that circumplex, okay? Depending on where you are on those things. So in a moment, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to actually have a, a quick dialogue at your tables about something. But before we do, I wanna make a connection between that DISC model and what we talk about with the, the typical mindsets, if you will, associated with these styles. So a mindset, that's all about, you know, where, where, do you, where do you first go when you start thinking about something? And the C quadrant, the mindset that we, we, we use there, we call that the objective mindset. The objective mindset is around you know, really separating facts from emotions and kind of coming at things with logic. So if we think about that and we get into this, this issue of conflict, right, 
there's a whole lot of really good value coming from this kind of a mindset. If you have an objective mindset and you get into conflict, you know, you're bringing data, right? You're supporting your opinions with facts. You're challenging people's assumptions so that we can dig down and make sure we get to the best solution we possibly can. But there's also a downside to this mindset, right? If we're objective all the time and to a fault, we can be seen as dismissive of other people, we can be seen as passive aggressive, right? So those are things that we need to be aware of if we have this kind of a mindset. So on the S side, we call this the harmonizing mindset, right? If, we're har if we have a harmonizing mindset, we think about other people's needs first, right? We wanna have this kind of calm situation, we wanna make sure everybody's heard, and that's fantastic for conflict. If we have a team that's getting into different ideas and we wanna discuss some things, man, having that patience, making sure that other people are, are, are saying their, their piece, that is fantastic. But there is a downside to that one as well, because what happens if you put your own needs subservient to other people? You are so focused on letting other people get their ideas out that you don't speak up. Or worse, you just give in to avoid any kind of a conflict or tension, right? That's, that's, that's unproductive conflict right there, right? It's on that artificial harmony side of things, but that's something you need to look out for with this harmonizing mindset. On the I, we have the outgoing mindset, right? It's, it's, it's relationships. It's, hey, let's, let's have these dialogues. Let's, let's, uh, let, let's make sure that we are, are having a good time. We have high energy. And of course, when we have energy in a dialogue, in a debate, that's gonna keep the discussion going. However, the outgoing mindset frequently can take that to the extreme and anybody ever had somebody in the outgoing mindset where it's time to get down to business and they're still being social, right? right? So that, that's, that's one of those things that if you have the outgoing mindset, you need to, to, to really be careful of. And finally, the D. We call this the assertive mindset, right? The assertive mindset is around you know, being direct, being forceful with your ideas, being confident in your ideas. You know, let's focus, let's get this job done. Well, there's... there's a, a downside to that, if you are too forceful, you know, next thing you know, everybody that you're working with is gonna think you don't care, right? That you don't have any concern for their feelings or what they wanna do. So those are the four main mindsets. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna give you an opportunity to think about your own comfort zone. So on the front of each table, there is a stack of paper. Everybody grab one of these, there's enough on the table for everybody, it's right in front of the water. And what you'll see here, this is, it says your conflict comfort zone. And then it has a list of 16 statements of productive conflict responses. And then next to that, it has a continuum from easy to difficult. So what I'd like you to do is just take a pen, read each one of those. I'm gonna give you about two minutes to do this. So you have about eight seconds or so to read each one of those. And just kind of in general, yeah, I find this a little easier for me to do. Add ah, this one's a little bit more difficult for me to do. And then as you see down at the bottom, once you consider them all, the two bullet points down there at the bottom, put a plus next to the one or two that are really most easy for you and put a delta or a triangle next to the one or two that you find most difficult. All right, I'm gonna give you about two minutes to do that. Okay. All righty. So let me ask you, did anybody mark all 16 to the far left? Oh, that's easy. Okay, great, my streak is still intact. I've never had somebody say, oh, yep, 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 piece of cake, piece of cake, piece of cake. Uh, so the good news about that is that it means that we all have something that we can work on, right? I mean, there's, there's an opportunity for each one of us to do something that helps us contribute to having more productive and less destructive conflict on our teams and in our workplace. Now, I wanted to share with you, um, just actually earlier this week, I got a, uh, a letter from one of my colleagues that had some information about the importance of working on these skills. It essentially connected the idea of self-awareness or mo emotional intelligence 
with this framework associated with personality styles and DISC. So I don't typically like to um, uh, put bullet points on slides and kind of go through them, but I did for this because I'm actually going to read them and I want you to, to, to see them on the slides because I want you to feel the weight of, of, this, of these words and, and what it's really trying to tell you. So the, the point is, how does the world see you based on how emotionally intelligent or self-aware are you? So with the D style, if, if we have a D style and she is highly emotional intelligent, the world's gonna see her as assertive, ambitious, strong-willed, and decisive. Right? Those, are, those are pretty positive kinds of things. Now, if that D style is not emotionally aware, right, has low emotional intelligence, we're going to see things, or you know, the rest of the world will see things like aggressive, demanding, bossy, and confrontational. If we take it to the I, if you have high emotional intelligence, high self-awareness as an I, Others will see you as warm, enthusiastic, charming, and persuasive. Whereas if you have low emotional intelligence about your own personality style, the world's likely to see you as easily distracted, selfish, a poor listener, and impulsive. Now really importantly, I'm pointing out, this does not mean this is what you are. This whole piece of, uh, of information that was shared with me is around studies of how does the world interpret you? How does the world see you? So I just want to make that point right here as we go through this. So S's with high emotional intelligence, high self-awareness, you're seen by others as patient and predictable and consistent and a good listener. Whereas a, an S with emotional intelligence, with low emotional intelligence about her style, she's going to be seen as resistant to change, passive, slow, or stubborn. And our C, with that high awareness, detailed, 